everybody, this is David Acton. Today I'm going to teach you a skill so you don't flip out when you see some gruesome dead bodies. Now, if you've taken off enough motorcycle helmets and their brains have come off from the cyclist in your hands, you learn these skills. When you get shocked, breathe through your nose and let it out through your mouth for four seconds. You get shocked, breathe out through your mouth. Look at a tree and get grounded. Find something that you can look at and stare at it. Do that four or five times. Then start reminding yourself of the times in your life when you've gotten through bad things before. Oh, yeah, I remember the one time I almost drowned. I remember the one time I was in that car accident. Do that four or five seconds. You'll become grounded again, and you can move forward. Because you know what? All you guys polishing your guns in your basement, I mean, that's all good. I call that gun porn. But let me tell you something. When the fecal matter hits the oscillating device, these are the skills you're going to want to know, my friend. That's why I teach them. That's why I don't do gun porn. That's why I give you skills that you can put in your brain so that when you're confronted with the situation, you know what to do. Until next time, this is David Ack. This is the way that I am filtering the rainwater I've caught off this roof. And you can see it's a, a two filter system. I first use a netting or screen for this plastic bottle. Then it goes through this cotton bandana through this bottle. And this bottle filters water into this. That's the container. The reason I didn't put the straw all the way to the bottom is because any sediment that manages to make it through this cotton bandana will fall here, the heavier sediment, and this will just bring this water into this clear bottle. Then I will add bleach. Now most of my water that I catch is used for the garden, so I don't want bleach in it, and that's why I use a double filter system for potable water. One cotton bandana, netting, two plastic bottles. Straw, and there's silicone there to help seal it. The straw isn't all the way down, which allows sediment to reach the bottom and you're actually taking off water, that is. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Global Government News. Today is Friday, January 20th, 2012, and I'm Darko. This is my website, ggnonline.com, and on YouTube, if you'd like to visit, it's ddarko2012. Uh, all the headlines and links will be posted in YouTube's video description. Um, here's a poll, and then I'll move on. Do you believe there will be a military conflict with Iran this year? So far, 67% say yes, followed by 16% saying maybe. Okay. Now, I'm not exactly sure if there's anywhere you can actually go without offending people as far as public property goes or private property. Um, I had my own little encounter with that recently, but I'll just cover this. Uh, do I need a bug out location? Uh, where do you live? Where you are currently living is important. If you are living in a large city or a town, you're at risk having some place a couple hours away from the area you live might be a good idea. In the event of a large scale disaster, emergency services will quickly be overwhelmed without trying to sound like an alarmist. You could find yourself in an area that quickly becomes riot prone or open to looters that decide they want everything you have without emergency services you can become a target of course without uh, owning a firearm or some kind of protection to be a target too uh, do you want to stay in the city or risk having to shoot looters or be shot by them uh, so it goes under says where you can go some people think if it gets uh, bad they'll just head to the mountains the problem with that thinking is everyone else will have the same thing in mind if they don't no, anyone, uh, once they get there, no one will willingly allow them to stay. Well, I guess it depends on the per person and how many people are coming in, but it says here, what if the nearest mountains is 200 miles away? If you don't leave before the problem, you may get stuck in this city, then what? Ideally, uh, you should choose a spot that is several hours away, a place far enough 
away uh, for whatever disaster comes, uh, you're not in the same region. Otherwise, when the crap hits the fan, uh, it says you're still stinky. So it says here, is the area you are looking at equipped with basic necessities? Does it have water? Does it have shelter? Uh, you can't just buy a piece of land and never spend any time on it until something happens. It has to be the basics for survival. Uh, finishing up here, how would you get there? Uh, how you will get there from uh, home to your bug out location is important. It says here, if you are in New York City, you may not even have a car. If you buy a bug out location, you must have a reliable form of transportation that can get you there on a regular basis. See, if you buy a bug out location, that's what I'm saying. It's like, I realized that just recently when I was, um, I camped out in the woods just like, what, about a week and a half ago? Well, at least I tried to, and I almost did it until I was getting chased off the property at night by a canine, German Shepherd, uh, with a with like a little uh, blue LED light that flashed and as it got more aggressive it turned red and my dog and I were in, my, in our tent and they're just trying to be quiet uh, but there's really it just seems like there's nowhere to go I mean you, you have to pay wherever you're going to be so you can't just uh, be a nomad or anything like that and that's why this whole prepping thing I, I like to put it out there but at the same time it's kind of like um, it's almost like things need to get really really bad uh, in order to get better and uh, everybody's like, this guy was willing to ha uh, unleash his dog out on me and possibly uh, maim my dog. And then I would have ended up shooting his dog for protecting his property. But it's woods. This guy had a humongous, you know, farm or whatever. And then he had these woods that I guess he owned and, uh, uh, you know, leased out to hunters and stuff like that where they sat up in these trees and just, you know, looked down and shot these uh, deer that were walking by. It's really sporty, I think, you know. Uh, but anyways, and dressing in camouflage as if the animals aren't going to see them or sent them, uh, sense them. But anyways, um, yeah, so you know, this guy was willing to have this whole standoff unleashing the dogs on some dude that's on his property camping. You know, what if I was a, what if I was like a homeless vet and I had nowhere else to go when I was out there? He's, I'm going to get mauled over that, dude. You know what I'm saying? It's like you can't take that land with you to the spirit world. You can't take it with you, dude. But that's, that's the mentality of uh, people now, and I don't think that they mean to be like that. I think that's just the way it is. But while I was out there, it was kind of nice. I was able to try to work on uh, getting my fire started with just wood, which was hard, but I got close. Um, and using my flint and uh, uh, basically uh, making water. I mean, it was kind of like a bear, it was actually kind of like a bear girl's moment where where I uh, I dumped myself off or I was dumped off, and uh, I had this water with me. And it, in like trying to do it all fast, I ended up breaking the container and all the water spilled out in the beginning. So I actually had less way less water than I planned on. So then I end up having to use little scraps of snow that was around and and then uh, you know putting it through a sock that I had in a cup and then boiling it. And uh, and then I actually had pine needles, so then that helped with the taste and that. So. Anyways, reusable hand warmers. A couple years ago, I purchased some of these hotspot re reusable hand warmers from Emergency Essentials. And it says here, uh, what are they? These hand warmers are a plastic pouch filled with liquid, usually sodium uh, acetate, that creates heat as it crystallizes. It says Wikipedia has a little more information on how the chemical reaction works. The hotspot warmers are approximately 3 inches by 5 inches and a little over half inch thick. And it says here, uh, you have... Your hand warmer is sorry is supposed to be stored in a liquid state and has a little metal disc floating around inside of it. it says grasp that little disc and flex it. It doesn't have to be flex much then uh, to start the chemical reaction. It said uh, this part is pretty cool. It forms crystals starting at the disc as they spread. It says the hand warmer heats up. Watch the video below. So I'll post the link here for you. And I'm personally not too big on the bleach or the tablets and stuff like that. Um, you know, and these hand warmers, again, like, they're going to run out. I mean, you have to think about stuff as running out kind of like bullets and ammunition and going with a bow and arrow instead of, you know, relying on that system. So you can uh, check this link out. I'm not going to go completely through it, but it's about uh, Prepper's China. It's about wood, and that's what I would go with because, you know, with metal, you risk uh, having, um, well, it's more weight to carry around, which is a big deal, especially if you're carrying a cast iron uh, skillet. But uh, but what? You know, it's rust. So if you, if you have wood here, it would be kind of nice. But uh, it goes in here. I didn't ever even thought about it, about how you can actually make this. So you start off by looking for a suitable log or branch. Look around the area until you locate a chunk of wood that's neither punky nor rotten, but big enough to be made into a practical container. I'm talking about a pot, cup, or spoon. A piece of timber that will hold a quart or two of liquid and uh, solids when its uh, center has been burnt out to form a bowl uh, will make a good stew pot. 
So, you know, it goes in there and says you want to make sure you avoid poisonous um, trees. Uh, it says try to use, utilize pine, cedars, oaks, and hickories. And then it uh, basically goes in there and it says hardwoods take more time. Uh, but what you want to do is uh, once you selected a suitable chunk of raw material, chip away the bark from one side until you have a flat surface or platform. Then place the hot glowing embers uh, from your fire in the center of the level spot and blow on them, causing them to burn slowly into the wood. And lastly, it says after charring the depression to the size and shape you want, use a sharp stone uh, or knife or metal spoon to scrape out the burnt flaky residue inside the bowl. Then find a rounded rock. This is what I use every day to crush my fennel on that. Uh, to put in my little morning concoction of uh, vitamins in that. A rounded rock and use it as a sanding stone to grind out and finish your work. So... Uh, but there's places that you can buy this stuff. I just started looking around. It's weird though. It's like the only um, wooden spoons in that that I can find are, are they're called you know referred to as uh, kids products. But uh, I think it's kind of dumb. I mean, it'd be nice to actually have one of these smaller spoons right here. So the links will be posted. You can check that out. What to do with your Federal Reserve notes? Talking about your dollars in a survival situation. So for those uh, accepting a hyperinflationary destruction of the U.S. dollar at some point in the future, you might want to consider hanging on to your U.S. dollars, at least uh, some of them. And so there still may be a use for them in the post uh, collapse. It goes in there and talks about a snowshoer uh, who was lost in a blizzard for two days on Washington State Mount Rainier, or Rainier, sorry, said he stayed alive by digging out a snow tunnel and burning the dollar bills for warmth. This is the irony that I've came across when I was at um, Mount Mitchell in North Carolina and other parks and stuff like that. Because uh, there, like I said, every square inch of the Mother Earth has been sectioned off, right? Uh, man owns the Earth. At least they think that they do until they until she shakes them off like little... Um, like an elephant shaking off little ticks and fleas and stuff like that. But it goes on here and he says that uh, the biggest worry that he had besides surviving and staying warm was he was worried about the national park. You're not supposed to have a fire. That's right. No fires. <laughs> but come out and camp and feel like you're outside and outdoors and living with nature. He said money made for the best fire. He said laughing nylon socks and packaging, not so great. Of course, you can use it as a teepee. So... So I, I wanted to cover this around the uh, the wooden bowls and that, but either way, I'll finish up with this and we'll go into uh, some wild edible food in the next video. Seven tips for cast iron mavens, or soon to be mavens, says I love my cast iron skillet. Even though I've had it for less than a year, it is the most used piece of cookware in my home. I have to agree. I this is the most used in my house too. Perhaps it's nostalgia for what I perceive to be the good old days. Think Pa and boys cooking up some chow and bonanza, blah, blah, blah. But uh, it goes in here and it says, whatever the case, I'm now really into cast iron. It says uh, some tips here. Seasoning is your friend. Cast iron needs to be uh, seasoned in order to acquire nonstick capabilities. An unseasoned piece of disaster is waiting to happen. Your food will taste like, well, rusty iron. Food will stick like crazy and clean it up. And uh, basically it goes in there. You can purchase pre-seasoned pans. That's actually what I did around my neighborhood and uh, at the Mennonite store. It was really nice, like $15 in the pre-season. It's really, really good uh, quality uh, gear there. But uh, she goes in her and says, uh, you can do this by wiping a thin layer of vegetable oil or uh, olive oil, that's what I use, uh, along the inside after each use. says, uh, then use a, a little mop thingy I purchased on Amazon. She said that she's been doing this to her skillet and it's been getting nice and dark. She says, I'm sure that the time will come when I can give this up. But for now, I like how nice and shiny the pan is. I tried to get my mom's, but she just wouldn't give it up. I mean, it goes all the way back to like my Swedish ancestors uh, like three generations ago. It says here, cook with a bit of oil. So just like coating the pan with a thin layer of oil after each use, uh, while the pan is new, you should still cook with a bit of oil. Then preheat the uh, the pan. Cast iron heats evenly. No uh, hot spots or cold spots on this puppy. Take advantage of this heat. Preheat first. Uh, yeah, because basically you can crack it. That's what, uh, what I know here. It says here, store cooked foods somewhere else. The acid in the foods will break down the seasoning in your pan and impart a metallic taste. When the meal is over, take the time to store your food in a suitable container. And lastly, never ever use soap for cleaning and dry thoroughly. It says, we'll destroy it. Instead, scrape off the bits of food left in the pan. And if necessary, use some salt and a tad of water as a scrubbing agent. And whatever you do, do not allow your cast iron cookware to air dry will rust instead dry it well and for good measure add that coat of oil we talked about and number one above and she just goes into how qualities uh counts and it was passed down from her grandmother if you can get them like i said but uh, i went for this because i was trying to avoid that teflon crap that's on it seems everything has that teflon coated stuff from dupont and that and uh, you don't want that stuff
This is GGN and I'm Darko. Thank you.